So without any further ado, please um, let me uh, welcome uh, Rick to you. And then you're all set, Rick, for your slideshow. Now, do you want questions before, or during, or after, or doesn't matter? I, I think after would probably be easiest. So we'll hold questions until the end. Okay. Yeah. And um, so we're ready to go. So we will uh, put on our mutes and uh, you're all set. Great. This Thank is where we you. keep our fingers crossed. That's <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Paul. And it's a joy to be back at the Philatelic Society of Lancaster. Uh, I want to thank you, Paul, and, and Dr. DeComo, and it's great to see so many faces. I, I recall many of you that I've gotten a chance to uh, meet in person and in the Zoom meeting, so thanks so much. I'm going to uh, quickly start my share here. So can you see that okay? I hope that shows up. Can you see that one okay? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Good to me. Okay, great. Well. I want to, I'm going to get rid of this little, uh, there we go. Okay. I want to start by saying uh, that, you know, I've presented before on several forgers and hucksters and their lives are certainly entertaining and exciting and fun to explore. Yet the majority of folks in our hobby, including those here tonight, are really awesome people. And sometimes we just don't hear enough about them. And so this evening, I want to share the story of one of the good guys of Philately who was a real giant in our hobby and a champion of stamp collecting. So here we go. He was very active around 75 to 95 or so years ago. And we'll talk about his entire life while also enjoying a deeper focus on these years. So let's frame things a bit. There were zillions of active stamp collectors in the 1930s. And the fellow that I'm going to talk about offered the idea that 10 million was a conservative estimate in 1934. We had a stamp collecting president in the White House, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and youngsters were active too, much more so than today, uh, since there was no internet or cell phones and no TV yet, and baseball card collecting was really a niche thing at the time, and lots and lots of kids collected stamps in their youth. So that provided the setting for the era that the subject of my talk was most active, and his name was Colonel Ralph Kimball. He was a fellow who shared his extensive knowledge of philately in a variety of ways, and over several decades, he really enhanced the hobby and made a household name for himself in many collecting circles. It definitely earned his name, the Stamp Man. So a couple of years ago, I found some interesting postal history associated with him, I, being, I began collecting items pertaining to Colonel Kimball, and I got more and more passionate about finding out who he was. And so I searched his name on several stamp boards, as well as Google, of course, and Ancestry.com and Newspapers.com, and became more fascinated with this well-regarded gentleman. And as I began to prepare the story, I got a really wonderful break, and I was able to connect, with the help of a dear friend, with his marvelous son, Dan Kimball, who's 88 years young. In fact, I just saw his name in our Zoom meeting tonight. So I'd like to welcome him as well as any other family who may have joined us as well and thank him for his kindness and generosity. Uh, a little bit here, Dan's a retired professor and he's created over 500 watercolor paintings. Here he is at an exhibit where he won a special ribbon. And the first time that we spoke, we were on the phone for an hour and 20 minutes. And it was such a treat for me to visit with him and hear some wonderful anecdotes about his dad. And many of the details that I'm able to share with you tonight are because of that wonderful time that Dan spent with me. So I hope I'm honoring the Kimball name with the reverence it deserves. Colonel Kimball was a really good guy and, and, so, and so is Dan. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, his dad, Ralph, was born in 1893 in Kansas City to a Unitarian minister and a well-educated teacher. The family moved to Galesburg, Illinois around 1899 or 1900, and uh, Ralph began collecting stamps when he was eight years old. That would have been sometime around 1901, and I got to tell you, I had to ask uh, Dan if uh, there was any chance that his father may have collected souvenir stamps from the 1901 
Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, which is one of my uh, focuses. And he said, there's nothing to specifically suggest. Reporting in progress. Nothing to su uh, specifically suggest that he collected those. Yet Dan did say that his father enjoyed saving Cinderella stamps, mostly pertaining to stamp clubs or shows. So at some point, he began saving stamps from many places, including Argentina. And over the years, he put together a complete collection of from that country, which he sold in the early 1950s. As an adult collector, he became very fussy about condition with regards to stamps that he saved. And as a youngster, besides philately, Ralph also had an extensive collection of butterflies. And uh, when he grew older, Kimball attended Knox College in Galesburg, which is where his mom, dad, brothers and sister had gone, and son Dan would go there too. Ralph was on the debate team, and here's a notice of Knox College competing against Beloit College in Wisconsin. Also while at Knox, Ralph was a member of a fraternity. He became scroll member number 37 on January 1st, 1916. And now the records also show there uh, him as deceased on January 1, 1918, yet he was overseas in the Great War at that time. Ancestry.com's military records indicate that Kimball enlisted in World War I on April 6, 1917. And son Dan noted that was possibly due to his sense of adventure. At some point, he got the Spanish flu and was hospitalized in Luxembourg for a couple months. He served in active duty in Europe and was given three medals by the French government. This picture shows him as a young soldier. He was relatively short, about five foot six inches, but broad shoulders, and he was quite a, quite a strong fellow. So the newspaper in their town, the Galesburg Registry Mail newspaper, noted that Kimball wrote a letter home to his mom, dated July 13, 1918, which arrived in early August. Ralph was 24 years old, and he wrote about the food and his impressive physical fitness, running into a fellow Galesburg soldier, and his ability to speak French. And he also mentioned, I know a girl of 19 whose father and two brothers were killed on the Somme, and she's now supporting her crippled mother. But a braver, more cheerful person I've never met. Tonight I saw her hang out the tricolor from her window and to think what that flag means for her. Kimball continued, quote, those in America whose dear ones die in France should not wear black, but white for the honor that is theirs. We over here forget the love of life and fear of death. They are such little things after all. And also in the letter, Ralph went on to talk about attending a Catholic mass and a special service for soldiers from that town who had been lost. And he closed with, quote, I'll be back in the thick of fighting very soon. But don't worry, mother. I don't. My love to you all. Ralph sailed back to the States on the SS Victoria, which left France on July 7, 1919, and arrived in Hoboken, New Jersey, 11 days later. He's listed on this passenger manifest as a first lieutenant colonel on line number 33 there. A few months later, he married his high school sweetheart, Ruth, on October 1st, 1919, and they would have four kids, uh, Ralph Jr., born in 1921, Theodore in 1923, Patricia in 1929, and Dan in 1934. Back home, Colonel Kimball enjoyed time with philately again, and in February 1920, as this edition of the Stamp Herald shows, he applied for membership in the Society of Philatelic Americans. He would soon become SPA number 3456. What a great membership number that is, huh? Well, Ralph and his dad, Ralph Sr., worked for the Barium Screen Company in Galesburg, mentioned in this 1923 trade magazine notice. It was likely later that year that Colonel Kimball, his wife, and his growing family moved to Chicago, where he held several jobs, including working in a steel mill and driving a taxi cab. He eventually became a salesman for Powers Regulator Company, selling thermostats for industry, and the 1930 U.S. Census lists his occupation as a sales engineer. 
Ralph's military service continued in the reserves. Here's a contribution that Kimball made to a 1926 field artillery, uh, artillery journal, quote, The Song of the 240. And as you can see, his title here and on the next slide addresses him as Major Kimball. Now, this notice shows his involvement from 1927 and 1928 in the 6th Field Artillery Brigade and the 78th Field Artillery Regiment. Back to Philately, here are some interesting covers addressed to him on Avalon Street in Chicago. The first one has a Scott 644 Saratoga commemorative on it. And the next one here has a Scott 611 President Harding Imper stamp, as does this one, uh, now with the Dante Avenue address. Ralph always had the stamp collecting bug, and around this time, his involvement in the hobby really began to take off. He was fortunate to land a slot at Chicago's 50,000-watt WMAQ radio station, which had been founded by the Chicago Daily News in 1922. Kimball began a regular weekend afternoon show called Stamp Talk that was broadcast from December 1930 to April 1934. Later on, some of those Stamp Talks would be on Tuesday and later Wednesday nights. He would note on his personal stationery that Stamp Talk was the first and oldest consecutive philatelic broadcast in the entire world. Here's the original transcript of his very first radio show, which was heard on December 13, 1930. He would type out his stories and make various edits and add notes to improve his work. And after a few introductory paragraphs on that first broadcast, he featured Scott's number 630 the red General von Steuben commemorative stamp. In all, Colonel Ralph Kimball would write 109 stamp talks in about 40 months. Newspaper listings like these would alert listeners to Ralph's upcoming topics. He was a wonderful storyteller who loved to talk about history and famous figures. They included presidents, inventors, statesmen, military figures, and others. And, you know, I, I think as I did this research, how wonderful it would be and exciting to hear those old Stamp Talk radio shows. And I, apparently none of the audio has survived or been, been preserved. Uh, but Ralph was a terrific typist, though. And uh, transcripts of the shows are at the American Philatelic Research Library. It's, it's just fascinating to read them. And you get a feel for Colonel Kimball's friendly nature, his philatelic knowledge, his magnificent vocabulary. And his show Stamp Talk had a regular stamp news segment, contests that were popular with listeners, and there were always details on how to get free printouts of his Stamp Talks, care of the radio station. Next up is a cover addressed to Major Kimball with compliments of the Stamp Dealer's Bulletin. From time to time, Ralph would provide on-air mentions for having received similar items. A little before this was postmarked, WMAQ was sold to the NBC Radio Network in 1931, which meant that his radio show's new vast exposure made Kimball a well-known national figure called the Stamp Man. And Ralph's reach spread across print media as well. He wrote a regular stamp chat column for the Chicago Daily News, and those too became syndicated across the country. His column gave him another outlet to share his passion for the hobby and provided additional exposure. Kimball was also writing a Fundamentals of Philately column for Stamps, a weekly magazine. Newspaper notifications like this one in the Racine, Wisconsin Journal Times appeared everywhere, as Stamp Talk was broadcast in nearly every state in America and almost every province in Canada. Now, 1932, was a really impactful one for Colonel Ralph Kimball. And his first book entitled How to Collect Stamps was released. Ralph wrote the book because when he began collecting in 1901, there was no roadmap or instructions about how to do so. A question as simple as, how does one save their stamps or mount their stamps was not easily answered back then. Some collectors at the turn of the century actually glued their stamps to album pages or even taped them down. Ralph felt that he could provide a great service to Philately if a proper guide was published, and he was just the fellow to do so. Now, this is the first edition dust jacket 
I, I don't know what a second edition looks like yet. Here's a third edition. This is the new revised and large and illustrated edition. And this is the one in my collection. And here's another version. The owner of this one showed me the title page and the inside and it matches my third edition. And uh, I trust I'll eventually get to the bottom things and figure that one out. But uh, back to covers, uh, the back covers seem consistent. And as you can see, the publisher was Grosset and Dunlop. And behind their marketing strength and mentions on Ralph's radio show, which was all across the country, this book was a bestseller, especially in philatelic circles. Here's the inside front cover showing a plethora of postage stamps of the world. And here's the wonderful dedication page to Ralph's children and his wife, Ruth. He affectionately dedicates how to collect stamps to them. Here is a page of postal history illustrated inside showing caches from various covers, including one with Ralph on it. And here's another page of interesting covers from around the world, all addressed to Ralph Kimball. The publication was very well received. Here's a review from the September 25th 1932 Atlanta Constitution. As you can see in the middle here uh, from the review, the book's initial price was just 50 cents and folks pretty much everywhere had glowing words for the book. It was such an asset of philately. This is just one of numerous, numerous uh, reviews that were positive that I found at newspapers.com. Later on that fall, another season of Stamp Talk was announced this notice mentioned that his topics are by far the most interesting ever given, different from anything heard in the past. And it notes here that he is a specialist in educational philately. In October 1932, an active stamp club in Ripon, Wisconsin, was celebrating their first anniversary. They were proud to be American Philatelic Society Chapter Number 101. To observe the occasion, they invited Colonel Ralph Kimball to come speak and postcards were issued to mark the occasion. They have a cachet of Colonel Kimball on them and proudly note that the stamp man of WMAQ comes to Ripon. This one is signed on the reverse at the bottom there by the club president, and it was sent out before the special anniversary celebration took place, and covers were also produced to commemorate the event. This one is signed by Ralph A. Kimball himself and was mailed from New Hampshire to the Ripon Stamp Club's secretary four days before he actually spoke. Here's a couple more, which were postmarked on the day of Kimball's talk. The top one was canceled at noon, while the bottom one has a 7.30 p.m. cancel on it. And as you can see, both of them are signed by Ralph A. Kimball. The next month, Kimball made an appearance at Chicago's well-known Marshall Fields Department Store on November 12, 1932 as part of a National Children's Book Week observance. It was a chance for people in his hometown to hear him speak and to purchase his popular book. The following month closed out the year with a stamp talk focusing on the story of the Christmas seal, which was broadcast on December 18, 1932. And this image shows what a listener would receive if they wrote to the radio station and requested a transcript of a particular show. Ralph's original text that he read from on the air just had typing, while the versions uh, that were mailed out sometimes had a graphic like this Christmas seal on it. So these are pretty cool uh, keepsakes in themselves. Kimball's interests were always expanding, and the May 1933 edition of the Air Post, air Post Journal noted that Ralph had recently become a member of the American Airmail Society. I'm sure this thirst for knowledge provided more topics and information for subsequent Stamp Talk episodes. Next came an important event in the nation and the city of Chicago's history when the Century of Progress opened that same month, May 1933. Colonel Ralph Kimball had anticipated the event and wished to celebrate the grand opening with a special cover. He offered his listeners the opportunity to add a fine piece of postal history to their collections. President Roosevelt was to have personally officiated the ceremony, yet due to the weight of official business at the time, Postmaster General James A. Farley instead appeared and he opened the historic expo. The stamped cachets on the cover that Kimball created mentioned both Roosevelt and Farley and have, quote, this was the original plan and, quote, 
this was the final action. The back of this long envelope has a beautiful color illustration of the century of progress. I love the artwork on this. It's just terrific. And uh, what a wonderful uh, collectible that is. And as I mentioned, listeners to Stamp Talk were offered the opportunity to obtain a cover honoring opening day of the fair with the two stamp caches from Colonel Ralph Kimball. Here is one with a 10 a.m. May 27th postmark on it. And here is one with an 11 p.m. postmark on it. I, of course, like this one because it also has a cool blue and silver foil Cinderella stamp on the back of the envelope. Now, numerous covers were mailed that day to obtain the May 27, 1933 cancellation. That's also because the response to Kimball's offer to listeners was absolutely incredible. Here's a picture of Colonel Ralph Kimball in his home. He's on the left there with his wife, Ruth, next to him. Their daughter, Pat, is the small girl in the back. And with them are friends and neighbors who were asked to come help with the overwhelming response as numerous mailbags were delivered by the United States Post Office Department with 19,330 requests for the souvenir caches. Son Dan Kimball said that he wondered if the mailman really didn't like the Kimball residence because servicing it was so much work. Anyway, Ralph was a true champion of our hobby, as you can see, and was really happy to respond in kind by providing the commemorative caches. I just love this image. How, how terrific that is. What a great experience. 1933 also saw the release of Colonel Kimball's second book entitled Commemorative Postage Stamps of the United States. He wrote in the introduction that there is no class of postage stamps which attracts such widespread interest as that which comprises the commemorative postage stamps of the United States. And he wrote about literally, uh, here we go. He wrote about uh, literally every U.S. commemorative from the 1893 Columbian Exposition stamps to the 1932 Scott 725 Daniel Webster stamp. Many of them had previously been the subject of some of Colonel Kimball's stamp talks. Okay, here we go. Next up, this is my copy of the book. I don't have one with a dust jacket and it's, it's not in very good condition. Uh, yet, uh, it's not in very good condition, but it is signed inside by Ralph Kimball. One thing that I enjoy about it are the, here we go. I'm having trouble with my mouse. One thing that uh, I like about it is that uh, inside are images associated with what would become the transportation series stamps issued for the 1901 Pan American Exposition. Uh, as you may know, the ones on the right, there's four of the six that were issued in the transportation series of the 1901 Pan Am series. And uh, there's the four corresponding uh, photographs um, that are associated with those stamps. Okay, we have a pause here. Try and share the screen again. Yeah, just, uh, I think when you, when you got out of it, it took you out of the program. Okay, let's go up to this one. And uh, I'm gonna go back to my Zoom here. And uh, let's see, share. Moment here. Okay, so I've got the screen. Let's hit Zoom, share the screen, and there we go. Okay, let's try this again. All right, next, if you can see that, okay, here is a 1933 summer mailer that Colonel Ralph Kimball sent out offering his publications and noting his philatelic activities. And this first image shows his two highly regarded uh, books there. And the next image offers a subscription to Stamps, the greatest stamp magazine ever published, as well as background on Colonel Kimball. Another round of positive reviews followed. The one on the left notes that this is the book that put Ralph Kimball in the philatelic spotlight. And I really like the one on the right. It's got folksy conversation style uh, uh, wording, 
Uh, and these are just two, again, of the numerous positive reviews that were published about his second book. Here's another piece of Colonel Ralph Kimball postal history. This item came from the Capital Stamp and Cover Service. It has a nice post-Depression era cachet that commemorates Scott 732, the National Recovery Act stamp. The next month, people in Detroit got the opportunity to meet Colonel Kimball at Hudson's Bookshop on November 4, 1933, and refers to Ralph as the famous stamp authority. Now, one interesting thing that surfaced while I was digging for Kimball-related material showed that before his second book actually came out, he had an idea for a series of interesting books that could appeal to a broader audience. This is a copy of a letter that he sent to his publisher pitching the idea for a six-volume set on the Makers of America, which could be marketed to educational institutions for its genuine historical content. It would have been uh, it would have interesting text and uh, black and white cut images picturing each subject. He envisioned it as being nicely bound and printed on quality paper so that each volume could sell for a dollar. He said in the letter that uh, that would leave a nice margin for profit for us both. And he noted that I'm not interested in any more cheap books at low royalties. Now, in this letter, which I just love, Kimball provides a rough outline of the first three volumes. He noted that, like before, most of the subjects had been topics of previous stamp talks. And this is such a terrific piece of stationery. It, it's like a complete resume there, philatelic and otherwise, and notes many of his accomplishments and passions and uh, affiliations. Uh, it, it's just a great thing, in addition to three of the chapters that he had in mind. Here is what he saw the Benjamin Franklin entry looking like. And the cut image on the right would replace the image on the left. Now, this uh, image on the left is what people would receive uh, if they wrote in to request stamp talk number 20, uh, 77 uh, transcript. And uh, here is Alexander Hamilton and William Seward entries along with their cut images. And Ralph also had a cut of himself made. And this is the original receipt for 25 portraits for which Kimball paid a dollar each back in April, 1933. And unfortunately, as far as I know, the project never saw the light of day as the idea must have been rejected by Ralph's publisher. Um, it's incorrect, but that's my assumption. Yet Colonel Kimball always had a number of irons in the fire at various times. Now let's, let's go to the summer of uh, 1933 again, after uh, uh, his second book came out. Now, son uh, Dan Kimball said that his dad often told him that stamp collectors are among the nicest people in the world. And that summer of 1933, Ralph made plans to go and meet as many folks as he could. He embarked on a magnificent 23-day cross-country philatelic pilgrimage, which took him to 15 states in 23 days. And he created covers to commemorate his fantastic 7,000 mile journey. And I must say, that's what initially drew me to Colonel Ralph Kimball. I bought this cover and uh, it seems so exciting to me to travel so far to connect with people and talk about stamps and probably sell some books and look for philatelic treasures himself. And what a blast that must have been. You know, and as you can see, this cover was mailed on the very first day of his excursion to a fellow in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania postmarked July 14, 1933, and I was ecstatic to wind up with the entire set of all 23 covers mailed to the same collector, each one with a different date stamp on the cachet in different colors. Now, Colonel Kimball's route, and I got this from the postmarks on here, took him from Chicago across the country to a variety of cities, and I'll try and move my mouse here. He went from Chicago to Wichita, Kansas, to Colorado Springs, and then uh, west to, to uh, up to Denver and west to Salt Lake City and Sacramento and Palo Alto, San Francisco, Crescent City, California, then north to Portland, then Seattle and into British Columbia and Victoria, then back down to Spokane and Butte, Montana, and then uh, over to Wyoming, Cody, Wyoming, spent five days in South Dakota and Deadwood, Custer, and Murdo, and then Ames, Iowa, 
before returning home. 23 days, 15 states, and 7,000 miles. How terrific is that? Now, most of the covers appear the same, yet there's a few uh, exceptions that are interesting to note. The second day's cover was postmarked in Wichita, Kansas, and includes the Cinderella stamp from the Sunflower Stamp Club. So maybe Ralph attended a meeting there or could have even shared or spoke. Uh, here's the cover from Victoria, British Columbia. Ralph still put Century of Progress stamps on the cover, along with a three cent Canadian stamp to make it legitimate for posting. That's pretty neat. And the cover of the August 3rd postmark actually has a date stamp in the cachet of August 4th, yet the uh, next day's uh, cover properly aligns with an August 4th cachet and an August 4th cancellation. And then the final cover sent from Ames, Iowa is a nicely autographed uh, one by Ralph Kimball as he completed his amazing cross-country philatelic pilgrimage. The stamp man then returned to his stamp talk series and here's a nice cover with his name and a WMAQ corner card. This item was sent to someone in Denver, Colorado. Next up is the transcript for Ralph Kimball's very last stamp talk that he ever did which was broadcast on April 11, 1934. The topic was presidents and postage stamps with a focus on the late President William McKinley. Now, even though Colonel Kimball left the radio world, he was still incredibly active in philately and his expertise was highly valued. Here's a medical bulletin from the VA issued in 1934, and it focused on the benefits of stamp collecting as a worthwhile advocation. Now, as well as benefit for good mental health and healing. And, you know, it made me wonder that if this bulletin was published today, it might highlight the benefits of philately to reduce depression or possibly lessen the effects of PSTD. And, you know, as a veteran who'd seen war firsthand, Colonel Ralph Kimball was a great resource for the medical authors of this bulletin to contact and quote. It's actually a very interesting read. It champions philately really nicely, and it was another way that Colonel Kimball was able to give back and be of service to people. And another way that he did so was by giving away thousands and thousands of small stamp packets over the years, especially to kids. He loved to get youngsters exposed to the hobby and hoped that they, like him, would embrace it for a good portion of their lives. This picture shows three little packets that son Dan Kimball gave to me. And each one has a small folded printout of some interesting history and its association with stamp collecting. By this time, Ralph Kimball's name was well known, and he was asked to write an introduction to a special stamp atlas and dictionary published by Rand McNally in 1934. His books were still easily available, and ads for them were frequently seen in newspapers or in magazines like this one, Wonder Stories, the best of in imaginative fiction. And as you can see, the back cover has an advertisement for Ralph's first book, How to Collect Stamps, with a 98 cent price tag. For those who are just getting familiar with Ralph Kimball, notices like these touted him as a famous philatelist. Colonel Ralph A. Kimball, author, lecturer, and specialist in educational philately. His quote there uh, frequently accompanied these mentions, and I, I really liked how his blurb closes with, Quote, postage stamps tell the story of the world and record the experience of the human race. And they sure do. Third publication was a small softcover booklet called Stamp Collecting for Profit, How to Make Money in Stamp Collecting. A thousand were printed by the Beverly Hills Philatelic Society of Chicago in August 1935. Here's the title page, and each one is signed by Ralph Kimball, and each one was numbered. And I feel really lucky to have number 64 there in my own collection. The booklet has four sections, including buying, selling, and preserving with detailed information over 16 chapters. Uh, son Dan told me that his dad later said he was kind of sorry that he wrote the publication. Apparently, Colonel Kimball didn't think it was good to impress upon youngsters that you could make money from stamps. And I sense that he may have preferred that people collect for the fun of it and the education that it provided. Well, even after ac his activities at WMAQ were behind him, Colonel Kimball was still recognized by many 
as the stamp man who had been on the radio. And I'd like to interject here real quickly that another fellow uh, named Captain Tim Healy soon became known on the radio across the country also as the stamp man. Uh, Tim Healy had a show which was sponsored by Ivory Soap. Well, anyhow, Colonel Kimball continued to champion his love of the hobby by speaking at local stamp clubs whenever he was asked, and notices like these appeared in various papers all the time. In October 1936, Colonel Ralph Kimball also became the editor of the American Philatelist, the monthly magazine of the American Philatelic Society, which had been publishing since 1896. Except for a four-year break, Colonel Kimball would serve in that capacity until 1951. In his first issue as editor of the AP, Colonel Kimball wrote a history of the American Philatelist in celebration of its 50th volume. And the bottom portion there on this slide shows that in 1944, Colonel Kimball received the Luff Award for outstanding service to the American Philatelic Society. Here's an announcement from 1937, noting that Colonel Kimball was speaking at the third annual dinner at the Louisville Stamp Society. His topic was today and tomorrow in stamp collecting. And here's a picture of Ralph from 1938 and his philatelic associations and interests were still widespread. Besides being a member of the APS, the Society of Philatelic Americans, the Collectors Club of New York and the Chicago Philatelic Society, he was also a member of the Austin Philatelic Society. And for my fellow collectors from Texas, in the July 31, 1938 edition of the Austin American Statesman, a notice appeared championing the following year's Texas Philatelic Convention. And in order to get your stamp books up to date, one of the recommended readings was Colonel Ralph Kimball's How to Collect Stamps book. See, you can really see there was a long life to that book in its various editions. Next up is a nice cover from March of 1939 with an American philatelist corner card that has Ralph Kimball's name and address on it. Kimball was a prolific writer, contributing regular columns, answering letters in print. He was always a strong advocate of the importance of philatelic literature and the hobby, so much so that actual stamp collecting was a secondary pursuit of his collecting activities. Colonel Ralph Kimball was an authority on hobby research materials, and he regularly submitted advertisements like this one, asking if anyone could help him acquire specific materials. Well, military service came calling once America was drawn into World War II. Colonel Ralph Kimball was in the reserves, and when called, he wrote a letter saying that though he was very proud of his military service, he was now 49 years old and had four kids, etc. The armed forces called him back anyway to active duty, and Colonel Ralph Kimball left his editorship at the American Philatelist magazine in 1942, and he served until 1946. He was in Camp Swift near Austin in the summer of 1943. Colonel Kimball went to Europe, returned stateside, and then went to Japan and served with General MacArthur. He later received a bronze star for meritorious service. And once he was mustered out, he returned to his old duties as editor of the American Philatelist magazine. This special delivery cover was sent to Colonel Kimball from New York in October of 1946, noting his position with the AP magazine. You know, and when looking for information about the fella who mailed it there, David Chasey, it was really neat to find out a couple things. Uh, Mr. Chasey was a teacher in our nation's capital in 1940. Here's his draft card from the same year, noting his employment. And he may have met Colonel Kimball in the service and kept in touch. And another reason that he might have connected with Colonel Kimball is because in the 1950 U.S. Census, David Chasey listed his occupation as stamp dealer. And it's just so much fun to find the backstory to postal history whenever we can. And here's a nice cover addressed to Kimball in the role of AP editor, which was mailed from Columbia. And next up is another cover from Colonel Kimball with his American Philatelist corner card. This one was mailed in the fall of 1950. Now, son Dan Kimball said that his father continued to add incredible materials in great amounts to his home philatelic library. They lived in a modest, modest two-story house and 
since there were so many books and stamps upstairs, workmen had to be brought in to add giant braces and columns to the home because of the fear that the weight of the books would cause the second floor to cave in. Apparently, there were jacks that held up the ceiling. And eventually, after his time editing The American Philatelist came to an end in 1951, Ralph made the decision to part with his incredible philatelic library. He said that 50 years of one hobby was enough. And parting with everything was a massive undertaking. By this time, Colonel Kimball had amassed one of the largest philatelic libraries anywhere in the entire world in this modern, modest suburban home at, at that. It took months and months to coordinate things. This is a letter from Mid-States Freight Lines sent just before they were to pick up 241 cartons of books with a weight of approximately 20,000 pounds. And it also knows that notes that Kimball had to provide help to load up two trucks. Well, everything was delivered to Cy Colby in New York City, who's a very well-known and highly regarded auctioneer. This is one of the auction catalogs that had uh, Cy had printed and widely circulated. Here's the title page from one of the Colby auction catalogs. And it took his crew three months to coordinate things. And Kimball's collection took three auctions to eventually liquidate everything. Now, Ralph's biography inside the auction catalogs noted that the collection was started in 1920 and was now almost complete in basic texts and periodicals. Here's the bio. There were over 7,000 pieces with many rare one-of-a-kind items, and one of the main bidders turned out to be George T. Turner, who also had Kimball's passion for philatelic literature. Mr. Turner purchased several distinct collections, and he later donated 3,000 volumes to the Smithsonian's National Postal Museum's library. So what did Colonel Kimball do after that? Well, he had lost a 33-year-old son in the service in 1954, and it really shook Ralph and his family. He moved to Gross Point, Michigan to be closer to other family members sometime around 1957 or 1958. He spent time taking photos and also became a carpenter. He had a large workshop in his basement and made absolutely beautiful furniture, mostly out of chestnut wood, that were marvelous pieces of work. And his son Dan said that when Ralph was interested in something, he totally immersed himself in it. Mail continued to be sent to Colonel Kimball, the American philatelist editor. Here's a cover sent from Monaco in the fall of 1960. And as you can see, it was forwarded to his residence in Michigan. This would be years after he uh, had finished being the editor there. Other mail that continued to, to uh, reach him was this cover from Robson Lowe, a stamp dealer in England, which Colonel Kimball really enjoyed. And here's a letter from the Society of Philatelic Americans sent to Colonel Kimball in Michigan as well. This is from 1969. Next is a first day cover that made its way to Colonel Kimball in 1972. His health began to catch up with him by that time. And like many of that era, Colonel Kimball was a smoker. And on October 8, 1973, he passed away from bronchitis. And the fellow who said that philately was the greatest of all pastimes and who had given so much to the hobby was inducted into the American Philatelic Society's Hall of Fame in 2004. He was an amazing guy with a passion for philately who loved to pass that on to others whenever he could. And there's a quote that I found that I'd like to read here. Ralph said, stamp collecting is enthrallingly fascinating. There is so much to see and to learn from these beautiful or bizarre fragments of paper. They tell the story of humanity, depict history, geography, art, science, all the phases of human knowledge in such graphic form. Postage stamps tell the story of the world and record the experiences of the human race. What a wonderful quote. So again, I would like to thank his marvelous son, Dan Kimball, for his time and friendship and great stories and pictures that he shared with me. And Dan was so gracious uh, with his time and provided a lot of interesting background to expand on the Colonel Ralph Kimball story that was already known. And I'm grateful to his wife for emailing me several tremendous images that have been a huge contribution to this presentation. 
And I want to take a moment to thank fellow philatelist named Dan DeWitt, who provided numerous Ralph Kimball postal history scans that we've enjoyed here tonight as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have you know, regarding Colonel Ralph A. Kimball and son Dan uh, also uh, uh, can provide any information if you have any specific questions for him. And I wanna thank you so much for your attention and letting me share the story of the Stinkman. Thank you very much for a wonderful story of a, a great man. And that his son could be with here tonight and joining us. That's just a just a real treat, real treat. Um, now you mentioned several sources where you receive materials. Do you have many yourself, the covers and things? Yeah, I I have a book that might have uh, well, it's got the twenty three from the uh, the uh, cross country trip. Uh, maybe another half a dozen. Um, I have three books. Um, I don't have every edition of that uh, uh, how to collect stamps, but I'm on the lookout. And actually, one's coming in the mail soon, a first edition. Um, so you know, several dozen things that I've enjoyed. And you know, when I talk about um, you know, people like this that we may not hear about um, as much as others, um, it's just a wonderful experience to be able to find things and piece things together. And, you know, any one of us in uh, philately can do that. You know, these aren't expensive items by any means, yet they certainly are uh, a fun way to compile a collection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So many of the, um, like the book reviews, and things like that, those are like from family files uh, the, a that lot were loaned of the, to you or scanned? The, the book reviews, probably uh, almost all of them, I'm going to say, came from newspaper.com. Um, okay. okay. You know, I, I love doing research there. You can just uncover a lot. A few might have been from Google Books. I think the fraternity uh, notice was from there. Um, the notice from the... Uh, uh, company that he was with his dad that came from Google Books. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I just love, you know, trying yeah. to go down as many <clears throat> avenues as I can, see what comes up. That's great research. You could probably find somebody's number of parking tickets if you worked hard enough. You know? <laughs> yes. Eating yes. tickets. A uh, <laughs> question came up. Uh, do you know if there are any recordings of the radio shows that Ralph? Yeah, a great question. I spend a lot of time specifically looking, looking, looking. Well, I found a, a, a guy that I'd actually seen about 10 years ago that sells old radio programs. I had bought uh, a song from the 30s from my dad years ago on cassette. So I, I explored again. And unfortunately, two things. He had retired. And so I printed out his uh, address and uh, his page and I wrote him a letter. He got the letter and, and I, he said, I'm not selling anything else and whatever. But when he got the letter, he emailed me and he said, I'm happy to send you two files that I have of the stamp man. And I was ecstatic. So uh, I said, please let me know what I can pay you or donate to a cause or whatever. And he said, no, this is my gift. And I got them. And these are just MP3 files. And so, of course, I, I forwarded them to son Dan. And as it turned out, they were not Ralph Kimball, and I'm quite certain they're Captain Tim Healy, who also uh, called himself the Stamp Man. Okay, yeah, yeah. Very good. Questions, people? Rick, that was a fabulous presentation. Uh, the last quote that you gave really resonated because I too started collecting when I was eight in uh, 61 and um, my dad used stamps as an educational tool with me in that he would give me maybe a, a, a heap of a hundred stamps from across the world and I was to sort them into countries alphabetically but then I had to tell him and show him on an atlas where the stamp where the country was and and then you learn, like you said, history about the country, about the uh, animals and natural resources. It's it it 
to me, it was always a great educational tool. Thank you for your kind words and that feedback. That quote came out of here, that uh, VA pamphlet. Uh, yeah, I, I did notice that when uh, yeah. you put that up. Very good, yeah. Other questions or comments? You know, as you mentioned, uh, he was so busy with, you know, the writing and the research, he didn't have a time to, to collect much. Do you know, did he collect much and, or what he collected? Would you or Dan know? Is there an album left? I know you show the uh, Argentina one, but. You can talk now. Oh. Welcome, Dan. Rick, that was marvelous. I Thank saw you. many, many things I've never seen before. I don't know where you got all that wonderful material. I'm so pleased. Uh, it's just absolutely a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I know my dad would say, there's a man who did his homework. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, I'll tell you something too. We make recordings of these and then put them on our website. So- uh, Oh, wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. Now that that's the good news. The bad news is is our editor retired, so we have to find somebody else who can go back and edit the last several of these. But we're hoping eventually it will be on there, and then great, you'll be able to hear well, our rich presentation. Even unedited, it was it was in in my mind so marvelous. Yeah, and Rick, it really warms my heart. Thank you, Dan. the The gold of doing research and you know delving into topics is connecting with people like Dan. That was just the greatest gift that I could have gotten from this whole thing. You can find postal history and you can, you know, find research, but, uh, you know, just my limited interaction with Dan just uh, warmed my heart as well. So thank you, Dan. Very much. Dave Plunkett, did you have a question? Nope. Okay. I, I I think the other question I've got, Rick, is when did uh, he have time to work? <laughs> I think Dan probably would be a better uh, person to answer that. Uh, my awareness of his work uh, pretty much stops around 1930. So was everything that he did after that philatelic related? Uh. He started to work for Powers Regulator Company, which manufactured thermostats and other uh, regulatory pieces of um, uh, equipment. equipment for heavy industry, particularly the steel mills in Chicago. And it was located in uh, Cicero. Mm -hmm. And so he had to commute from uh, our, our house, which is in South Chicago, uh, Avalon Park, which is uh, actually not a suburb, it was a development, but incorporated into Chicago. Um, I think it was uh, 1927. Anyway, he would get up early uh, and go to work at Powers and come back um, fairly, fairly late. I know that we always had dinner um, seven-ish. Uh, I got to have a snack earlier, of course, but uh, he he worked hard, and he continued to work at Powers Regulator. And after the war, he was made personnel director because during the war, uh, he'd established himself as uh, an extremely competent person. Uh, he was the inspector general for his division, was the 97th division, which he actually helped form. And when he came back from the war and uh, was recognized by the powers uh, bosses, uh, what a uh, competent person he was, uh, they promoted him from uh, his previous position to personnel director. And he kept that position until he retired uh, several years later and, and they moved. But uh, he worked hard and uh, I don't know how he did all he did either. Uh, <laughs> I, I do remember uh, that he did a lot of the uh, editing 
of the American philatelist on our dining room table. And I would quote help, unquote, uh, with him when I was uh, eight, nine, 10. So that's a little bit more. And Dan, Dan, did he keep up with uh, philately in any way or writing uh, once he moved to Michigan and got into the carpentry and photography and things? Uh, he kept in touch with some of the friends that he made uh, during his travels and his uh, uh, stamp collecting uh, activity. He kept up with the friends. He did not keep up with the collection. Uh, I know he always took the stamps off the envelopes as they came in <laughs> because they were left, but he, he, he no longer had a collection. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell him about the thousands of stamps you just gave away. Oh, my wife says I should say uh, during his time at uh, WMAQ, uh, he saved the stamps on the letters that came in. And there were mostly Washington Jefferson uh, two and three cents from 1909 to 1919 era. And I was bequeathed about literally something like 10 to 20,000 of those which I just gave away yesterday because I decided I was not going to go treasure hunting through that large box of uh, two and three cent stamps. Some were off paper, some were on paper, but very well collected. And um, who did you give them to? I gave them to the uh, Eugene Stamp Club. Mm -hmm. and Jim Jackson is the uh, the person that I was. I am associated with their a wonderful, wonderful philatelist, yes. head of uh, Big Blue blog. Okay, we have a question, uh, J.K. Core, Jor. I think I saw a hand. For me? For uh, no, a question. I guess not. Okay. I have one for Dan. I, well, please go ahead, Susan. Yeah, I just had a. I was fascinated by the seven thousand mile journey in 23 days back then i'm just i'm curious how he did that i mean i live in victoria british columbia and i can't imagine getting to victoria in less than a full day now from the mainland so i just wonder dan how do you know how he did um, that this was the first i ever heard of that trip oh okay so rick do you know how he did that that was going to be my question to Dan right now. Is had I assume he drove? He he, yeah. he knew how to drive. Mentioned he was a cab driver. He'd been a cab driver. Uh, so, so I, I, maybe he came. He must have driven. Maybe it was the coal or the no. There was another one from Seattle. Um, I forgot the name of it now. It's been out of. I I honestly don't know anything about that trip. Yeah. Well, that's cool. And and uh, Rick on that trip. What did he did he hold like press conferences or book signings or you know I, ha I haven't found anything at all um that's actually a great lead for me to follow up on uh I should probably include his name and possibly each one of those dates along with the city in my next uh, round of searches they but, might have uh, been stamp club visits exactly or, or you know kind of you know fans people who wrote them but yes it almost sounds like a whistle stop, but obviously it wasn't. If he if he if he drove, he might have taken a train. Paul, Paul, yeah. 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 take a train to Victoria. No, okay. <laughs> I, I figure uh, it probably was a train. If I looked right on all all those covers you had, uh, with RPO uh, cancels on them. Train, train would have made some sense. Um, he he worked for the railroad in Galesburg for a while, and um, I know he liked trains. Yep. Well, that, yeah, will, be part, that will be part two for uh, Mr. Rick. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, just remember back in those days, uh, there were passenger trains to almost every small town everywhere. So yes, it's very possible that it could have been a train. I 
I, I suspect that was the case. Um, we did have a car, uh, but I don't remember him driving it much, even in the city. Uh, but he knew, obviously, he knew how to drive. I, I also wondered around the trip whether he requested or, or put out, you know, uh, some kind of offer for people to sign up in advance to acquire these uh, sets of covers. You know, this one fellow that um, I wound up getting this set from, you know, he had all 23 days. And I would assume that he had to arrange that in advance. And Ralph didn't just make those covers just for him. So uh, somewhere there must have been an offer. Um, you know, now that I think of it, I have not read all 109 transcripts of the uh, stamp talks, but uh, I have uh, probably half of them scanned. And my next trip to the Philatelic Library in Belfont, I'll do the next batch. But uh, the, the writing in there, by the way, is just terrific. And maybe I should check out the ones that were just before that. But now that I think of it, that was a summer trip. And usually the stamp talks may have ended in like May or June for the summer. So he might not have even pitched it, you know, towards the end of that season. So I'll have to check that out. She did make a comment about returning to stamp talk as if he'd, you know, had some time off. Yes, yes. Neat. There's two good boxes at the American Philatelic Research Library, that's for sure. I spent several hours uh, uh, scanning them and, and uh, taking pictures and reading, and I couldn't get through all of those. And This is research... of Ralph's material? Yes. Okay. And, and I, I, one of the research assistants, even before I connected with Dan, because I just said, this is who I'm interested in. What materials do you have? And she said, I found these two boxes. And what do you want? And I said, well, can you kind of just give me a smattering? And she said, there's these bound volumes of 109. She said, if you want all 109, it's going to cost this much and it'll take three weeks. And she said, how about if I just send you a dozen? And I said, that's fine. And I got the flavor of it. And then when I went back uh, this past February, I, I scanned a whole bunch of myself. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a fan. Yeah. That's a fantastic story, Rick and Dan. Um, and it's great that those transcripts are available. Um, I guess it's worth commenting. I'm interested in old radio. And a lot of the times, the only recordings that were made and kept were on acetate discs, and they were. Um, basically kept in the archives of the advertiser. But um, in a lot of cases, after a while, they just got thrown out. I heard a story about the old show Fibber McGee and Molly was basically rescued from the dumpster of the Johnson's Wax Company. Because after a while, they, you know, just, oh, this, you don't need these laid around. They throw them away. So I'm surprised to hear that there's even some Captain Tim left, even though they were, um, you know, sponsored by Ivory Soap. Obviously, at that time, there wasn't a whole lot of recording devices available. After the war, you know, you had the tapes and stuff like that start coming out, but those could always be recorded over. So that's why there's a, not a lot of old TV sports available, because when they were done with the event, they just recorded over it. But <laughs> this is very fascinating. It was great to hear you talk again, Rick. Scott, did those things degrade, the tapes? They they can't the the That's discs crazy. I've seen uh I've seen old ones where they flake off so if they're not preserved very well they would degrade. Luckily, um, there was one guy in particular that really started to get interested in saving them and conserving them back in the sixties and seventies. He worked for radio, so I guess he started out the station that he had. Um, so a lot of the commercially available ones, um like the radiolas and the radio reruns and the stuff they used to sell in the 70s and 80s came from him. Okay, very interesting, yeah. This this is the Xerox of the fella that I contacted, and yet he says the stamp man, and there's Ralph's picture, but the audio that he sent me turned out to be Tim Healy. So, uh, um you know, and another thing, I, I love your comment there about the acetates, because I never thought that. What had come up is that maybe some of the recordings were on wire, 
And boy, then you'd have to have another kind of player. Uh, at least acetates, you can find a phonograph player, but a wire player would be a challenge. You can move it like that. You want to leave it that way? Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions, okay. comments, folks? Did you have anything else, Dan? Just how marvelous it was. I learned a lot that I didn't know, and I'm so grateful to you. Thank you. I'll be happy to get you all the images as well. Great. Yeah. Dan, thank you for your your all the color that you added to this. It was, it was oh, great. Yeah. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. He was a great dad. He was uh he was a terrific man. He seemed to, yeah, yeah. In the military service, you know, work, you know, full-time job, full-time yeah. philately, full-time family, you know, it's yeah. Uh, he was a kind and gentle man. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Invasion of, of Japan. Yeah, no, they, okay. they know they okay. know that. Yeah. Has any of the furniture survived? Oh, most of it. And it's scattered around in um uh uh, uh, my relatives. So uh, uh, we have something like 30 pieces ourselves, uh, including uh, china cabinets and uh, uh, yeah. dressers, uh, really marvelous stuff of, of several different kinds of wood. We'll send some, him some pictures. We can send you some pictures, Rick. Wonderful, yes. Yeah, he, he made stuff out of, out of cherry and um, teak. teak. Uh, wormy chestnut. Uh, he bought a, a great deal of wormy chestnut that had been uh, uh, the trees had been killed in the 1920s by uh, uh, insects, and he had had a big basement in Detroit in Gross Point where he did his carpentry. Um, it's just uh, they're they're probably upwards of uh, 50 pieces of his uh, in existence. You work big. Thank you again for being here. Yes, thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Last, uh,